Um, I'm here to talk about the most complex machines ever. It's driven by two things which have become increasingly apparent to me. Uh, one that Moore's Law, of which most of you will already be familiar, I'm sure, drives two times the capacity for, pro for producing products which are appealing. So it's not just a case of putting twice the number of transistors on integrated circuits, it's a case of making products which are ever more appealing. And the second one is that those appealing products are never uh, really uh, valued increasingly by, by the people who are buying them. So society is buying appealing products and is actually not remotely interested in the technology which is inside them. So two, two observations there. We need to have a better understanding of how we're going to design and develop these ever more complex systems before we actually are asked to do that, because we are going to be asked to do it. This is an opportunity which is there. Commercial uh, interests drive us forward. And the second, we need to be able to understand the context of what we do before we're able to tell people about what we do and for them to have any kind of understanding of the, uh, the roles that we play, because it matters if we uh, don't present the role that we play um, in a way which, which is significant, then those people will also ultimately cut us out because they don't need to fund things which are not important and uh, it's people who ultimately direct politicians. So that's enough of the background of this, I'm going to move it forward. Now my grey hair entitles me to, to talk about history. I'm definitely now in the, ca in the class of uh, people who are uh, old by a lot of classifications. Um, so I'm going to make the, this thing of looking back and um, that telephone at the bottom was the telephone that was not on my desk, it was on the wall in the office where I sat with six other people and it was uh, the telephone for, for the office and it was a BT Yeoman telephone and it was in manufacture for 20 years. It was one product which was bought back then, it was manufactured and it had a lifetime in excess of 20 years. You can still find these things in car boot sales and you can buy them, you can take them home, you can plug them in and surprise, they actually still work. They're very, very archaic and if you look at the circuit diagram which is at the bottom left and it is a complete circuit diagram, there's no, in, no electronics in there at all. It's an electrical product. Now if you compare that with the, uh, the fellow on the top right, which is a Samsung Galaxy S5, it's already out of date, it's been replaced by the S6, so it really only has a lifetime of about a year. It's incredibly complex, and each one of those blocks which are, which are shown inside it, in themselves will have hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands of transistors or more. So there's an awful lot of difference between those two products, which in many respects, though, are still producing the, the same thing, which is a, co a communication machine. So products have changed hugely in my life, technology, methods and tools inevitably, but business models and global markets too, because these have been subtle changes, and because humans don't really notice subtle changes, then we tend to think that things have always been like that. Like that. So it is worth looking at <coughs> history, if only to give you an idea that things have not always been the way they are today. Now, not all of you are as old as me, so you can still tend to say, well, of course, in my lifetime, it's been like the top right-hand corner. I'll demonstrate to you that that's not actually the case either. Um, one, thing, one thing that you can note, though, is at its, in its day, the bottom left product was revolutionary because people have not been using electricity for all that long so this was quite a clever product and it was it had to go through a process of design the uh, research development uh, design development and product path RDDP um, would have applied equally to the top left product uh, at the bottom left product on the top right product so maybe there is something we can learn from history now it's interesting to note though in both of these worlds just how much the change happened. So integrated circuits engineers, the people who were working in the telephone business, and that was me later on, a little later I moved into the business, um, I was working with that but one of the things that I was bringing in to the, uh, to, the, to the company at that time was integrated circuit design. I knew a little about it from college and I knew some other things and I went into a group which was an embryo group and we were bringing electronics into the telephone. People were saying, why do you need to bring electronics into a telephone? We've got a perfectly good telephone. You know, my wife said it actually. 
what I said uh, I came home one night and said I was designing telephones and she she paused for a while and she said but we've already got a telephone see we were groundbreaking we had a telephone in our, our own house uh, similarly you can look though in that top group and you can say software engineers came from somewhere else even the electronic products which are more categorized by integrated circuits the early ones didn't have any software and so later on you've got to add software now of course again all of these additional skills came in from somewhere so we need to look at it now to look back and say um, you know do we learn anything from our ancestors we might as well go right the way back because actually it's not that far and this is an interesting thing and it's really part of the reason why we are designing the most complex machines ever not the most complex machines in this lifetime ever and that's an interesting thought because it's only 35,000 years ago that Cro-Magnon man which is us emerged out of the evolutionary swamp and uh, wise humans though, though they were spent an awful lot of time around a thousand generations just surviving that was their priority and at the end of the, the roughly 32,000 years the process of evolution had got us to about this you now it's, it's engineering, it's basic engineering and you can look at it now and you can say well that really didn't take much thinking about but actually it's the same people. If you took those people, you put them through a modern education system, you provided them with the modern environments, sciences and technologies then they would be able to do essentially what you and I are able to do today. So it was only the environment in which they found themselves that, uh, that constrained what they did. Now around two and a half thousand years ago the philosophers emerged now these guys I imagine uh, had enough warmth and food and, uh, and generally uh, d were not didn't have so much things that they had to do they actually had leisure time and they started to think a little bit about uh, about the materials which are around them about that point then they were starting to understand nature they were banging things together they were boiling things and looking and see what they did uh, and they weren't very good at it but it spent a long time after a couple of thousand years they picked up quite a few and interesting facts about the materials which surround them and surround us still today so it wasn't until around a thousand years ago that the scientists Descartes uh, Galileo um, started to think in terms of okay we know something about these materials let's let's start to look at what they might do when we combine them as, a, as opposed to simply just look at them so they were manipulating nature and then the third group and this is the group that I'm really interested in are the emergence of the engineers because these are just 250 years ago and this is the industrial revolution and it began here in the UK and it spread around the world the industrial revolution its mission was the exploitation of nature and so the in unwritten part of this one is it had business involved in it as well and so what had happened here is that somebody had now realized that not only could you boil water in a container and steam come out of the end of it but basically you could make a machine out of that and then that saved having to have a horse or a human uh, and you could create a mechanism which would allow you to weave cloth and this was revolutionary because it was something which could be done on a regular basis and somebody could make money out of it which so the other thing that developed at that time was the availability of money as well money was around before then but it wasn't everybody didn't have access to it because there wasn't the need you couldn't go to a shop and buy stuff until there was stuff in the shop <coughs> so Technology's Big Bang was just 260 years ago. So when I talk about these machines being the most complex machines ever, then you have to remember that zero is only 250 years ago. We've come a long way in 250 years, and I kind of guess we're going to be around for the next 250 years if we don't kill ourselves in the meantime. Uh, and you can imagine then how far we're going to progress between now and the next 250 years, or indeed the 250 years after that. Now I think the thing that really strikes me about this is that, because that is the research, development and product cycle. It's extended over two and a half thousand years, but it is actually the same cycle that we use when we do product development today. It's just extended. Those guys didn't know anything about materials, so they had to understand materials. Then they had to develop uh, the idea of a product and extend it to something which is deliverable in exchange for money. Now we've done a lot to shorten that cycle time. 
but we have still got those elements in the cycle time so it is worth looking at the the fundamentals of this now I'm going to talk about computing but not going to get heavily into electronics or computers but computing is more or less at the frontier of technology today most people will will agree that these some of the great big machines there which high performance computers are probably the most sophisticated and biggest machines that uh, anybody is likely to see um, so they're certainly high performance and they're certainly at the frontiers of technology uh, the workstations which are smaller versions of that more targeted towards a certain class of applications in many ways are no less complex they're just smaller instances of this and I wanted to em emphasize here the difference between complexity and scale the one on the left is big and complex the one on the, on the right is still complex it's just smaller so size doesn't always go along with complexity but if you look at computing computing is really just solving mathematics it's uh, doing it frequently enough to, uh, to make it applicable for controlling some sort of circumstance or observing or understanding the behavior of something but essentially it's processing maths and the maths are representations of something which is interesting to people um, people are very self uh, centric in this it's hardly surprising whether you're predicting weather or whether you're actually predicting the behavior of some uh, material you, the intent no doubt is to use the material to some benefit and the benefit is always human but one thing is apparent is it's not prescriptive about the implementation technology so computing computing sorry um, is nothing to do with electronics computing neither is it to do with binary neither is it to do with analog it's to do with any of them so if we go back then and look at the earliest forms of computing then this one is um, uh, hyperacusis antikythera which is a bit of a mouthful um, this is 190 BC or 100 BC somewhere around that we don't know it for sure but this is a machine which was pulled out of the Mediterranean and it was a machine for calculating the position of, uh, of the planets for, for what purpose nobody particularly knows but chances are it's to do with navigation but it might have been to do with religion uh, there were probably tens of these uh, there were certainly no more they were all handmade and interesting to think about it handmade at a time when you couldn't go around to B and Q and buy a sheet of metal you actually had to make the metal yourself and if you wanted to make a gear like that which was big and the reason there's a lot of gaps in the gear is that you use less metal if you do it that way and you rivet the bits together because there aren't, tool, there aren't other tools available for you to do it and you cut the gear teeth with a file that you had to make yourself so the, making a machine like this is quite a different challenge um, the technology there says handmade metal hand cut gears engraving and analog it's an analog process but it nevertheless worked for predicting the positions of the planets so it was necessary to help to navigate around the Mediterranean now interestingly it took 1800 years after the first the development of the first one for uh, Graham George Graham to come up with what amounted to the first product productized version of that um, still uh, computing the uh, planetary positions still analog but much more able to make use of machine tools and factory made metal um, it's still using uh, analog technique as I say and it was using wood you don't often find instruments these days which incorporate wood as part of the structure except for the the box that goes on the outside of it 1800 years later between the product develop if you think about it the prototype and taking it to production Babbage's difference engine 1837 getting a lot closer to home uh, this is a much more complicated piece of kit able to use much more sophisticated materials and so on um, and it was used or the objective was for it to be used for computing polynomial tables uh, tables were the cheats way of doing computation uh, much much speedier than a, an entirely hand pro hand based process that preceded computation um, nevertheless um, Babbage kind of got this wrong um, the product was unproducible because it went beyond the, the capabilities of the technology which was available in the day so it wasn't actually until the year 2000 that it became possible to make this machine 
and that was um, interesting because it was it would have been just too expensive there would have been too much slack in the gears there would have been uh, too much uncertainty to make it practical at the time when it was able to be designed so he designed it but it went beyond the technology of the day <clears throat> now another one of broadly the same era is Amsler's planimeter. Now, this is a fascinating piece of kit and you can see that it's actually still in use today. You can still get versions of it. This, this fella enables you to um, move around an arbitrary two-dimensional shape and calculate the area of it. Now it solves that equation then which is, a, which is an integral of area and is really is enabled by the ability to, to precisely machine materials. So the machinery, if you like, the, the tool itself doesn't look all that complicated, but the machinery that enables it has become quite sophisticated. <clears throat> and then, of course, 1947 saw University of Manchester's baby, which is arguably the first stored program digital computer. Um, doesn't look much by today's standards, but it was a demonstration vehicle, and of course it, it was digital, it was based to digital, and it is the uh, forerunner of pretty well everything that we know as a computer today, and a lot of things that, that we don't even think of as computers today. Um, so we see it now in those as the origin of the mainframe and the, lap and the desktop computer I, I, I showed you in the earlier slide. <coughs> So hopefully by now at least one thing will have become apparent is that implementations are limited by the technology which is available at the time. So if I'm going to make a product which is based on anything then I have to know what the technology is that's available to me to make that product. It's an important thing to understand. Now Moore's Law uh, has given us an amazing um, product potential, so much potential that we, we kind of think it's going to go on forever. I'm using this, this diagram which actually came from the International Technology Roadmap for Silicon back in 1999 and it will become apparent why later on. Um, so it's obviously it's out of date and if we need to update it then that's probably a good enough indication of where we are today. And, um, and it also helps you to position ARM on this because when ARM was founded back in 1991 we were talking about making integrated circuits with around a million transistors on each one of them now today you can buy I don't know what 20 billion transistors on an integrated circuit for around five dollars five euros five pounds uh, not a lot of money essentially but 20 billion transistors from one million is 20,000 times increase in functional capacity in addition to that, there's probably the order of 10 times or more increase in speed. So that's 200,000 times more capacity in an integrated circuit today than when ARM was founded. And ARM was founded in recent times, 1991. <coughs> so this is, this is what Moore's Law does to you quietly in the background. But 200,000 times means we may call the, this thing back in 1991 an integrated circuit. And we may call this one up here in more recent times an integrated circuit and they may look broadly the same when you hold them up in front of a microscope or in front of a magnifying glass. They're small, they're square, they're grey, but they're not the same. They're hugely different. The methodology, the tools, the chemistry, the photonics, the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the environments, the design environments are all very changed even though the thing looks much the same. So computing today then. I drew the, the, the earlier diagram with the mainframe and the laptop and I was misleading you because in many ways these are the computers of today. These are the things which incorporate the, the algorithm processing that we were talking about earlier. They're using, digi using digital techniques and they're doing it for a human function. Now the sad thing about this is that this is purchased by consumers and it's purchased for their functionality not for their technology so mostly the people are proud of the fact that they've got the latest Samsung Galaxy whatever 
Um, but, never, but they don't really understand what it took to create that thing. They have no real and depth knowledge about it, except that uh, if somebody else has only got a Samsung Galaxy 5, then clearly they are an inferior being, because the 6 is obviously much better. And the one with the curved screen, which goes around the edges, is very sexy. So you might think then that consumers are a bit of a problem because, you know, they... How are we ever going to succeed in, in delivering something which is going to impress them about our knowledge and our capabilities if the only thing they're interested in is what, what the outside shell looks like? They're interested in the, uh, the icons on a phone and the way they behave. They're not interested in the contents of it. They just don't care. So maybe there's hope in the professional domain then. Because these are the ones which are invisible, but they're also vital. You know, what stops your plane crashing? How do you avoid the thunderstorms when you're, when you're flying around? How on earth do you manage to get a seat booked on a plane and you can do it on, at home from your computer? Uh, what about um, congestion charges in London? I understand that £8 is now significantly out of date. It's a bit like the student fees. They just go up. Um, security, health, energy... Um, transportation and the, t the cup of tea and the and the biscuit is talking about logistics bringing water and energy and food from all over the planet is all coordinated increasingly by electronic systems which are of course invisible and whose technology is also not visible so we've got a situation here again where even in the prof professional domain there is only a very small consumer group or group of consumers who are aware of and consider the technology to be an important part of it this is a camera just 17 years ago, and that, that includes all of you. Um, so it was a mechanism for enhancing human memory. You take snaps, you take pictures, you go on holidays and so on like that. Um, its technology is very, very good. Excellent lenses, fine mechanical mechanisms. The plastics are not as sophisticated as they are today. Uh, but basically you'd recognise that camera and... An interesting thing was to think of film as a photochemical memory, because that's what it is. It's just a, a convenient way of taking a three-dimensional scene, expressing it in two dimensions as an array of coloured pixels, but, or film, to put it into a shorter context. The modern camera, still from Canon, still a leading edge camera, moderately expensive but not ridiculously expensive, so it was aimed at a consumer, the same sort of consumer, and its technology today is of course very, very different. Digital logic, software, memory, still excellent lenses, so that's still obviously being part of a camera. It's a very convenient mechanism to map the 3D world onto a 2D plane. Um, sensors and transducers, well, technology here that was simply not used back 17 years ago. Precision mechanics, micro motors, batteries, energy storage, LEDs, discharge tubes, and an awful lot of technologies that they have incorporated in a modern camera which were not in the older camera. Now, they're available to 21st century businesses today. So here's an observation. If I wanted to make a camera, I've got a wide range of technologies available today, much wider than, uh, uh, than Hyperacus had with his Antikythera. I mean, he barely discovered metals back then. Today we've got a range of technologies. And what we've got to start to say is, how can we incorporate those technologies into the product that we need in a way that's going to make our product sufficiently different that people are going to buy it from us because it's good or better than the competitors. So we're now, in many respects, not limited by the available technology. We're limited by the choice of technologies which we are going to use using our engineering heads. So, clearly that bit at the top there is an ARM-based computer. So an ARM-based computer is something that you can buy we don't have a shop in the quite, quite the same way as Apple has a shop, but you can go along and you can talk to ARM and you can buy an ARM-based computer. You can't buy all the other stuff, not from us anyway, you go to another shop and buy that. So clearly Canon are able to acquire the knowledge that they needed to use to create this, this camera. But could we do the same way around? I mean, could ARM genuinely decide that there's more money in cameras than there is in selling intellectual property uh, and that uh, the easiest way for us to proceed on this is to build a, an ARM camera? Um, well, actually, there are some very practical reasons why we couldn't. Although it's got a computer in it, and we know about that bit, 
we don't know about the other bits. And it's not that that information about the other bits isn't there, it's just not in our company. So our, because Canon has the capabilities in their company to handle those technologies, we don't. We only have the capabilities in our com company to design the computer. So Canon are using the computer that we designed, but they're not designing the computer. We, on the other hand, are good at designing the computer, but we're not good at, at making an exploitation vehicle like the camera, because our businesses don't go that way. So it actually turns out that it's the capabilities that are limiting a business uh, product's possibilities today. But the good news is they're also an entry barrier to your competitors. So Canon don't consider ARM to be a threat in the camera business, not surprisingly. We don't consider Canon to be a threat in the, uh, in the CPU IP businesses. We work together quite complementary. Now businesses are boring, and I think you, you have to get that over to start with. Business is not about doing things right, it's about making money. Um, making money is important, it's unpleasant in, the, uh, in a great idealist world where, where things like that, uh, we, we, would look, we would all like to, work, to be above such things like that. But the point about it is, it's businesses who make the money that flows back down the entire life cycle. So it ultimately supports your research, it ultimately supports uh, the, your education, but it also supports all of the people who are supplying components and elements into that product development. We may not like it, but it is a fact of life. And a business that doesn't make money isn't a business that's in business. It's only temporarily there. So uh, anything which is, which is losing money for a persistent length of time is very soon not going to, not going to exist as a business. So businesses need to know when they make a product, which is the line, the first line on there, they, that they can actually complete it before they start it. Um, risk is okay if you appreciate it. Risk is dangerous if you don't. And so businesses essentially want to minimize their risk. They want to design a product that they know that they can complete. They will look at whether they can include something new in it, but if they do, there's going to be a risk that they might get it wrong. And these days of international competition, it's very difficult. You can, you can be in a market, you can be a market leader, you can miss a beat one time and you're out of business. Anybody remember Nokia? Nokia, big leading company in the mobile phone business. They lost it, they missed the beat and the beat was to move to smartphones. They had the professional phone market sewn up and they missed it. So very easy to go wrong. <clears throat> so making a product, even when you know how to do it, is still work. You have to remember that. It's not just a case of saying, we know how to design an integrated circuit, here's an integrated circuit. You actually have to put large groups of people onto working on the details of that integrated circuit and then prototype it and then test it. And there's a lot of processes and a lot of stages before you actually get to that uh, completed uh, integrated circuit, even when you know what to do. If you put a large element of unknown in there, let's say we're going to use FinFET transistors on 10 nanometers. Wow, that's a lot of change. And uh, the risk associated with getting that integrated circuit has out has gone up hugely. Now, it might be justified on the business grounds on the sense that you can now have a product which has got a huge um, uh, improvement in functionality and therefore people are prepared to pay a large amount of money to get it. But, it, but in essence, um, if, if there's no link into the, uh, uh, into the business, uh, sorry, if there's a too big a technology step, then the risk of, your, of losing the business is too high to be taken by most businesses, unless they've already got problems. So businesses need to have an appropriate set of capabilities before they do a product development. Now, I've drawn it as a, a linear illustration here because in the main, this tends to be the message that, uh, that politicians push, this tends to be the message that the research councils push, that you have something, you progress it forward and forward and forward and eventually it becomes a product. And that's wrong, because the, the product is not the technology. The product is something else, it's how you use the technology or the methods. So it's, is the process linear as depicted here? No it isn't. Does a given set of capabilities lead to a specific product? No they don't. So we need to look more at capabilities.
Now I've come up with this thing which is which I call the capability model. It really is, it's not my idea, it's just an observation of what people do. So it's not new and I'm not claiming it's new. What it is is expressed. So people talk about capabilities and when they talk about them they more or less talk about them in this way as well. So I'm not I'm not saying this is this is new. The business community, the um, MBA community tend to talk about a business's capability like it is a singular thing. So Arm is a complex company, we don't just make one product, we make a range of products. Some of them are uh, intellectual property, some of them may be printed circuit boards, others may be software. They're all sorts of different products, but they're part of what is Arm. So to say that Arm is, is described by one capability is incredibly naive. We clearly have capabilities, at least a set, to do different kinds of products. Now I've just ordered them and said, for any particular product, you need to have a range of capabilities before you have a product. Now the, the thing about it is the concept is something that somebody has. I've got this idea for a machine to calculate the position of the planet, because it would be really useful if I'm navigating around the Mediterranean. I'm going to, I would like to be able to sell it to people to make some money, because I've got a personal interest, I'd like to have a pension, and then, then I, I've got a stages in between. The stages in between are essentially encapsulated technologies which are available to me to enable me to meet that end goal. So, capabilities then are installed technology, and the thing about them, the important one from my point of view, is they are installed. These are the, these are the technologies which a given business has got available to it to use on that particular day to design its product. I can't use technologies that I don't have, despite the fact that they may be outside there in the world. They're not in my business, there is a risk associated with putting them in there. So there is technology then, and new technology does come in, and new technology when it comes in does become a, pro a capability. But the other thing that tends to be overlooked here is a capability is not just one technology, it might be several technologies. And incorporating a capability takes work. Not usually a huge amount of work, because you might be looking at what somebody else already knows how to do. You're just learning how to do it yourself, you're bringing it into the business. So over here, Imagination Technology, who are probably ARM's main competitor, uh, they may know how to do something with a particular kind of synthesis or, or compilation, or they may have some uh, angle on digital signal processing. We know that it's known technology, it's over here, but it's not in our business. So part of the exercise of bringing it into the business is that, that work. Now this, isn't, uh, this doesn't tend to be uh, presented as this way in any textbooks that I've seen. Um, now science, of course, um, is similarly out there. Science is going to feed into technology, but science is raw. It's, it's established predictability. It's something which has been encapsulated, but it's not yet ready to base a product on. It's probably not productive enough. It's not fast enough. Um, it may only be an enabling component of your end system. It's certainly not going to be your end product by any way, shape or imagination. So again, bunches of sciences may feed into technology, so you need to have high performance workstations, large memories availability, uh, you need to have uh, um, synthesizable languages available before you can use synthesis tools. So here is a synthesis tool, let's say, but it is based on a range of sciences and technologies which feed into it. Now there can be a very large amount of unknown work here. So simply because something has been proven in the lab, used once, doesn't mean to say it's anything like ready to be a technology. And making it into something which is robust enough to bet the business on, and that's the important thing, you're going to gamble your business on this thing, its future can go down the, down the tubes very quickly if you get it wrong. So getting that right becomes a major issue. But it also now clearly defines where we are with the role of research and the role of development. Development is exploiting capabilities. Kind of easy. And research is inquiring, understanding and establishing a capability. So the role of research is to put capabilities into place. Now, that's a wide scope because 
if I'm in business then the, the research is bringing an, a known capability into the business but if I'm a fundamental researcher then I'm not interested perhaps in known capabilities I'm interested in what happens when you bang two rocks together this is fundamental stuff so there's a range of interpretations of the word research but the interesting ones from a business point of view are that's what I want to do and that's what I want to include to make it happen somewhere else down that, that chain you have people who are driving fundamental science and they want to get it to a technology level because if a technology if it can be at a technology level it's on the shelf it's ready to be used you only have to persuade a business that the risk associated with incorporating it the work associated with incorporating, incorporating it is manageable and I've already said that so I won't repeat it now one thing you will discover out there is technology readiness levels are very popular these days over to the left hand side it's easier for me to point on this screen um, they are presented very much in the way a scale one to nine and when something has reached the technology readiness level nine then it's ready to go it's uh, it's a product now actually if you look at that scale you see that we actually hit technology level nine up here actually all that means is it's ready to be used to develop a product not that it is a product we need to have it much stabler than that before we can actually start to bet the, bet the company on it <coughs> so some uh, descriptive words capability a unit of deployable science uh, installed in the in a business such that it might be relied on for mission critical applications there's more words on these slides than I want to talk about but the slides will be available on my blog um, and the uh, from anybody else who, who I give the PDF to so it's not I'm not try, trying to keep any of this secret and you can look at it at your heart's desire <coughs> but capabilities are the foundations for product development and <coughs> they're established by the action of research so I've got to talk about research then research has two basic domains the short term and the longer term now if you're in university and it, to be honest in the world in general most, think, most people when they think of research tend to think of fundamental research but in business you have to think in terms of, uh, of research including the known set so I am very interested if imagination technology is able to do something that we don't know how to do then I'm very interested in finding out how they do it then that's research to me it's, uh, it doesn't, it's not brand new clearly they know how to do it but we don't know how to do it and so we, we would be interested in doing that similarly they made <coughs> they may look at us in the same way so a large part of research from an industrial perspective is from the known set so other people know how to do this the longer term stuff is from the unknown set and we're quite happy with that because in business I only I need to know that I'm going to have a future because that continuing opportunity that's presented by Moore's law or just the development of technology and sciences is going to continue to drive me forward I'm going to need to have answers in, a, in areas where I don't have answers today I plan to stay in business not just making a product today whilst it has a market but making a product over the next few years indeed many years generally speaking a company has a vision of the future which is on the same length of its as, as the time that as it's existed as a company so a small startup an SME has only been around for less than a year has practically no vision of anything which goes beyond the year a company which has been in existence for 20 years has got a lot of people who now have mortgages based on working for the company the company has a a model which is based on its existence it starts to look further out it knows that the market is going to change it knows that the technology that it's dealing with is going to change and so it has to find answers in that area and it can do that through targeted research so specific funded activity inside the company to address what they see as a, a, a deficiency but this is usually crown jewels so I'm not going to tell anybody else about this partnering research for other things like standards and activities where other people perhaps know more about it than you or we would make a good team member to be included in um, universities and institute research generic perhaps more more specific more original more fundamental 
and we do work with all of those people and all of those groups and I think that it's important to understand that research is not one thing then it's a range of things because when you target the research you do you should be targeting the, the activity in one of those classes. If you want to sell some research to an industry and you're trying to tell the industry that it should be using this for its next product, then you've got to be telling, you've got to be talking about something which is well established. If you're saying, hey, this is a really interesting science and um, you can see that if you had it, it would be a really useful thing to have, but to be honest, you're probably looking three to five years away before it's going to be at a standard where you're able to bet the company on it, then you will be in a position uh, where, the, where the company is going to think, hmm, not sure about that, but they're more likely to make a knowledge-based decision than if they feel that you're going to mislead them and tell them that your wonderful new science is only just a, a year or six months away from being fully exploitable. So we've both got to get realistic on that, industry and the research community. We're not, we're not trying to produce one solution because actually there's a range of research and some of which are, are, are going to be important to, to an industry and others are not. Uh, development then is exploiting the capabilities to deliver a product and that this, this focus on product um, is an important one because engineers are about producing product from technologies which are available. There is a large creative role in it and they're innovative in the way that they put the components together because two people can produce solutions to a market opportunity and one of them will be better than another. Why? And usually the, an the answer is down to architecture. The product has been created by somebody and the guy was imaginative or girl was imaginative and they did something and they put some components together in a certain way. They used hardware and software, they used uh, optics and they used RF and they used glass and they used plastic and they used metal work and, and they did it in a way though that had an appeal whereas the other product had less appeal. It's not to say that the other product wasn't a good product, it could be a perfectly good product, but the thing that's going to be a successful one is things like aesthetics, and that's um, not popular to think about aesthetics in an engineering or scientific context, but it's what consumers buy, and, uh, and those are the ones who are funding all this. But I, w it, I find a certain amount of comfort in that bottom line though. Innovation is and will remain a fundament, fundamental engineering role because an engineer has to look at the full spectrum of, of sciences and capabilities that are available and to put them together and to make it work because delivery is the, is the driving force on this thing. No point in getting a good, a good design if it doesn't actually turn up to be a good product available in the market when the market window is available to, to, to buy it. We've only got a year of product life so if you miss it by six months, well you've probably missed it forever, but you've at least cut your revenues by 50%, and if your revenues were determining the amount of money that you put into the development activity, then that's an opportunity missed, and you probably can't afford to. <clears throat> now just again as a throwaway, product is something you make which customers buy. The diagram says it all from my point of view. There are screwdrivers and there are screwdrivers. And uh, what's important is in a relationship like this that the supplier and the customer have got the same thing in mind. In the, uh, the guy on the right may be anticipating opening a tin of paint and uh, the other guy thinks an electric screwdriver is a fantastic piece of kit. And they're both true, but they just don't match up. And business relationships have to be sustainable, which means the relationships with customers have to be sustainable. So business then is the money-making machine, and it's different from the, the other product I was, I was talking about was a product, but business is the thing which puts it together. Business is the sustaining money-making machine. Um, they profitably sell what customers want to buy, and I put the, the, the brackets around you here because you are very two-faced on this, like I am. I am interested in science and I'm interested in technology, but I'm also a consumer. I buy stuff and I buy an iPhone not because of the technology which is in it. I buy an iPhone because I like the look of it and like the style of it. And I, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty as the, as the rest of, being, uh, of having a, a split personality on this. But the, those businesses are very good at selling stuff to me and they're also good at selling stuff to lots of people who don't know anything about technology. 
Um, they're all competitive these days and they also have to be competitive in a global market. Um, back in the days of the BT Yeoman phone, the market was the UK. That's it. There was no more. Um, it was, there were very practical reasons why um, the limit, it was limited to the UK. Language, there was international trade was difficult, there were certainly no much, uh, much, much more difficulties in terms of exchange rates and, min and uh, that kind of thing. International contract law didn't exist, containerization didn't exist, uh, so ships had to be effectively loaded and unloaded with cranes. You can't unload um, uh, cranes in the same way as you can unload grain. You don't do it with a big suction gadget or a great big scoop. And, and even palleting hadn't, didn't exist back then. So the globalization is a huge change. And these businesses, as a result of which, though, are competitive internationally. Now, before I finish on that one, you are also competitive internationally. Um, I'm glad to see there's a lot of international people here. I understand that hardly anybody here from the UK it doesn't stop the message. The message is still the same. You are competing for work opportunities and you're competing with people who are anywhere else in the world. And that means you have to be good, not just good in the UK, you have to be good in the world context. And that applies to businesses as well. Our businesses are desperate to avoid commoditization, yet governments want businesses to, uh, to, to commoditize. And in fact, when I go home and buy, buy my fancy glitzy thing, tech gadget, then I want businesses to commoditize too, because commoditization drives the price down. But businesses aren't really interested in driving the price down because that's bad news for them. Because the only thing that they're left to differentiate themselves with their competitors are quality and price. Um, quality is subjective, and so ultimately it becomes a price issue. So you are, uh, so businesses prefer to differentiate themselves by some technical aspect. And so there is a drive for businesses to do something which is different. And that gives them a drive to look at new technologies and to weigh up whether it really does offer something which is valuable for them to make the risk worthwhile. But it does mean that product development is a cost and it's a cost to be minimized. So that's why you will always be running with short budgets because uh, nobody, everybody wants the new facilities, they want the, the uh, uh, differentiation but they don't want to pay for it. So technologies then just enable options. That's a terrible downer, isn't it? You worked on this thing for most of your life and uh, you now know how to put down a line which is so much thinner than it ever was before. And actually somebody just says, I don't think we'll use that technology because it doesn't differentiate our product. And uh, it just means then that technologies create options. It's the engineers who look at the options and say, which of those options, when I put them together, produce a product which is differentiated and the risk is low. New technology may cost more than it delivers. Over design costs more. Good enough is enough. An awful thing again to say. Not pursuit of perfection. Reuse saves. Oh gosh, reuse is boring, isn't it? I mean, it's much more exciting to design something from scratch, but actually, no. And I'll come back onto reuse in a few moments. Because the successful end products fund their entire value chains, then the technologies from them will flow down to all lower volume markets. And that's another one to watch out for as well. So I'm going to look at that. Because. Um, <clears throat> If we start back here, 1970s, with the mainframes, then we see that uh, these were the computers. There weren't really any other kinds of computers. There wasn't large numbers of them, but they were used for biggish jobs, or jobs today, which we would, uh, we would do on a PC, frankly, but the sort of things calculating uh, pay, uh, wages for people, for employees, and so on. The different generations of computers have appeared. And it's interesting to note though that the older ones haven't gone away. There is still a requirement for mainframe computers. The jobs that they're doing are still big jobs but they're totally different description of big back in 1970 to big today. So the, we still have mainframes, we still have minis, we still have personal, we still have desktops, we still have the mobile internet and Internet of Things is appearing. There is a line there. It's become indiscernible because of the glories and wonders of Microsoft. Um, but the, the thing about this is the technology of the day 
is the technology that flows down to those other areas. So here you have arguably still the professional group who are interested in the component technologies which go inside the mainframe and the technologies that they're able to use are the ones that have justified themselves that are affordable because of the very large markets that they address. So the IoT, the Internet of Things, will create a new technology or new technologies of that there is no doubt and they will ripple down through all of those other ones or those other markets they will become the driving technology the older markets remain but they inherit the current technology from lead markets so I'm going to mention a little bit of ARM because it wouldn't be fair if I didn't uh, so ARM it's interesting to look at then when we make some claim, claims like ARM enables innovation across the entire industry what can that possibly mean uh, leader in wearables and IoT, 70% of the smart TVs, 95% of portable games, consoles, 95% um, of smartphones and tablets, 80% of digital cameras. These are all enabled by ARM technology. What does that mean? Well, back in 1991, and we know we were talking about a different era, this is what it meant. It was a CPU, this was it, it wasn't complicated, it was about 50,000 transistors, it was tiny. Our idea was we make that available as a component for use in a chip, in a Lego-like construction environment, where the component that we provide was this bit down here, and the components that the customers added to make it into the system that they wanted was poured around it. So it wasn't a terribly sophisticated idea, but of course it's moved on because it's moved on with Moore's law. Um, we now have billion plus transistors on an integrated circuit and one of those 50,000 transistor uh, uh, CPUs is lost as a little dot down in one corner. Now one thing, and this is the real reason I was using this chart, was this, this is the last chart I've ever seen which has the red line on it. And the red line is not just the number of transistors, the red line is the productivity required to deliver an integrated circuit. Now around the time when ARM was formed there was around a hundred person years of design effort went into making an integrated circuit. That productivity that we talked about, the 20,000 times increase in the number of transistors, meant that now we're looking at probably 20-ish thousand man years of effort to design an integrated circuit. We can't do it using the same methods, which is what I said. And that ignored the emergence of what also became a feature, the verification gap. We're designing things so complicated, actually verifying that what you've created is what you intended to create becomes a huge challenge in itself. And the thing that happened, which happened over that time, is that we progressively moved from being the domain of a single designer so when I first started designing integrated circuits, I did the first integrated circuit on my own. And I drew it on a piece of paper, which is this big, with a little logic template. And I, that, was my, that was me, my work. There was no simulation engine. It wasn't necessary. I, I could handle it in my mind. My mind was a simulation engine, which is good enough. But even by the time we were moving to the foundations of ARM, 1991, we're really only just moving into the very early days of needing a team to design an integrated circuit. Now we've moved on local teams, it was possible to produce integrated circuits with the number of engineers that you could find locally. Now you can't do that anymore, it's global teams now. Not only global teams inside the business, but global teams across the business. So it's moved from being a clean sheet design all the way through to expertise reuse we now have to incorporate people's, people's output, which is based on lots of experience, lots of knowledge, lots of work. They can only be used. So the people who design the camera that go into the iPhone, it's no surprise that camera is not designed by Apple. It's designed by people who know how to design a small camera suitable to fit inside a smartphone. And they probably supply the camera to other people who also need uh, the camera. The, so it might very well be the same camera as used in the, in the Galaxy phone. But the thing about it is, it's not differentiating as a capability from a customer's point of view. So the RF module, you know, who cares who, wrote, who, who designed the RF module? It's not something that differentiates your product. Therefore, all you need is it. 
and in many respects ARM's role to provide a CPU in there is also not important which, whether it's ARM CPU architecture or not. What matters is it offers a level of productivity and reuse which is important to get products out into the market today which significantly changes ARM's business model because we're not actually only in the business of supplying a CPU core these days, we're in the, in the business of supplying a productivity methodology. We're enhancing the expertise reuse which is necessary to produce very large and complex systems. So it's moved into a system design. And they would be un unproducible, they would be undesignable and unproducible without in excess of 90% of reuse today. We're probably sitting at around the 99% reuse today and we don't know it. It takes hundreds of man years to still design a thing like a smartphone, but, you're you, but it's hundreds of man years, whereas it would take tens of thousands of man years to do even the design of one of the chips in it. So that is huge amounts of reuse. So in the meantime, then, designer productivity has become the methodology driver. Because capabilities are still there, they're still required, but we now have to achieve a productivity uh, uh, game as well. It's not adequate to produce your smartphone a year after Samsung's smartphone. In fact, Samsung 6, they introduced it to compensate for the fact that uh, iPhone 6 had come out six months earlier. Uh, so clearly it's possible to produce things fairly quickly, but you, but you have to recognize that these are things which have come down a pipeline. They are largely the same, they're differentiating themselves by di incorporating features which are different and which are worth something in the market. The largely the same part of it is reuse. So reuse is, fundamentally, is fundamental because it increases productivity. Hardware, software, and other technologies, methods and tools, in company sourced, evolved, etc., etc. You can read it all. But clean sheep approaches, which still tend to be the academic's view of the world when it comes to research, incidentally, um, are not the case. We've never had them, well, we've not had them in a long time, and nowadays we certainly won't have them either. Designs have got to use, products have got to use, sciences and technologies which are established as much as possible. Now, if there's any doubt about it, back in 2011, Apple was pressed to uh, produce a list of their suppliers, and they identified 159 Tier 1 suppliers. These are the people who are supplying components into their products, all sorts of different components, all sorts of different uh, companies. There are two, tier 10 times that number of Tier 2 suppliers. And it's interesting to note that it's only at the tier 2 supplier that ARM makes an appearance on the list. So we're way down there. We're not the primary supplier of Apple. But it gives you an idea of the fact that there are a thousand plus suppliers of technology into something like an iPhone. And they're supplying all kinds of technologies and know-how, methods and tools. Tens of thousands of engineers and that more than 90% are uh, reused. The other thing that, that needs to be mentioned too is the emergence of this thing which, which I know of as the virtual component. Um, this iPhone has a bill of materials. This isn't a bill of materials of it, but the bill of materials is a list of the physical components which go into that product. Um, the list that I've put there alongside it are the virtual components that go into that product. They should be, in all honesty, on the bill of materials, but they're not. because. Nobody picks and places them onto a printed circuit board and solders them in. But nevertheless, the software which is in there, the knowledge which is necessary to produce the camera, the micro-machines which are associated perhaps with the assembly, with the, the manufacturing approaches, the robotics, these are all component parts of the iPhone. They're parts of the reason why we can make an iPhone and sell it today, and why we couldn't 10, 15 years ago because of the advances in the manufacturing methods which sit around it. They should be recognized, they should be componentized, because in many ways their price is included. What tends to happen is when they're costing uh, a piece of equipment like that, they include non-recurring engineering costs, NRE, and that's just a cost. Increasingly that cost is a share of the cost of the setting up the factory and so on, is just put in as a lump sum. But in terms of the component costs, it's rapidly becoming the single most dominant cost in a product like this. 
So, so the physical components actually cost significantly less than the virtual components which go inside them. Now of course I'm interested in this from ARM's perspective because ARM is a virtual component company. The thing that we supply is never picked up and soldered into a printed circuit board. It's knowledge and know-how. And we still have this basic roughly 50,000 transistor core which actually has a lot of use. Uh, people find it very attractive and we still have a lot of business based on the original CPU 20 years later. And we do have, of course, these larger ones. And in fact, the A15 is already being replaced by A17, I think it is, the latest one. Uh, but nevertheless, illustration of how, how fast this thing is going. These are 50 million transistors. So just to give a scale on these, there's a thousand to one difference in what otherwise superficially behaves like a CPU. The Mali cores on the right-hand side are the DSP cores, so these are CPUs which are aimed at a specific kind of mathematical processing. So if you like, they've got the general processing cores on the right-hand side which are really good at handling state and manipulation of relatively simple data, and you've got the cores on the right-hand side which are very much better at handling data and not so good at handling state. So you're, we're addressing different kinds of markets, and of course you see the four columns in the, uh, the right-hand side really illustrate that this is a multi-core, a multi-processor core. So it actually incorporates four cores inside that, uh, four CPU cores inside that system. And you're talking about being able to put tens of CPU cores down onto a chip these days and still have space around it for people to characterize it to do what they want to do. So it means that today we have 24 processors in six families it's all about matching the need of the market that a customer anticipates and making sure that we have the tools and the capabilities and the knowledge that they need to do it. And it's not just the processes, it's how to build them into systems. So a method to hang them all together. And this is an example of a, uh, a system integration that we deliver to help our customers to, to make the, the chips that they want to make. This one has four quad core processors so that's four four sixteen processors in there and people built systems with sixteen processors there are four DSPs here they don't shout out in the same way but they're also quad core implementations somebody uh, recently I think a few few weeks ago maybe even only a few days ago announced a chip which had a hundred arm CPUs in it um, this is what our customers do we give them the knowledge to put chips together they are the ones that have a better link to the market we're not telling them they mustn't uh, build a chip which has got 100 CPUs in it, but what we've got to do is to make sure that our methodology, our virtual component, enables them to build a chip. And not only to build a chip, but to write the software with, and to be able to debug it and to implement it in a product because the system matters, because the system is what people buy. So we also have all of this other stuff. The software, drivers, OS ports, tools, utilities, we also are well connected to around a thousand partners world, worldwide. These are the people who are taking our IP and using it to develop their products and their products will flow into uh, uh, ultimately consumer products or, con and, or products which consumers benefit from the use of. But it means that for a company which is only 3,000 people big worldwide, we are influencing strongly millions of developers all around the world. And that's quite an achievement. But to be clear, so when you pick a phone like this, we look at what ARM provides, we're not providing any of the chips, there are roughly 20 chips inside a, uh, a smartphone. We don't provide any of the chips, but we do provide the knowledge that goes into the CPUs on quite a few of them. In fact, most of the processors, modems, Wi-Fi's, the SIMs, Bluetooth, GPS, they all have ARM technology in them. So we're getting ARM in, not only in terms of the main processors, but into various chips which ultimately go into these systems. And we have products on the, on the left and products on the right which help to support that existence. So it's certainly not just a CPU company. And it does mean, uh, being, being globally dominant in this, means that last year we shipped 12 billion chips with ARM technology in them. 12 billion. And yet we don't make any. We have no factory. We don't make any... We, to be honest, we make a few which we use for our own evaluation purposes and for stocking um, uh, printed circuit boards for design kits. But generally speaking, the amount that we produce, and we don't sell the chips for, on the open market at all. And we've shipped 60 billion of them worldwide since we existed. That's an interesting number, because we've been in existence for around 20 years. 
yet we've only shipped 60 billion. We shipped 12 billion last year. Actually it was 2008 when we shipped a total of 10 billion. So that gives you some idea about how fast this market is growing. We now ship 12 billion a year and a number which is growing roughly 25 percent per annum. So arms business model then. Um, the main thing to note about this is the length of time. Two or three years we do research and development. This is essentially understanding what it is that we're developing, creating that basic model uh, and maybe having first discussions with customers. But at that point it's pure cost. It costs us to do that work. After we've got something which is usable to come out, a latest A-class CPU or something of that nature, we then go into close development with a partner. While he makes the first chip, um, we are still debugging the system, maybe making sure that the whole thing works, the whole design environment, the package of the interaction to all the other tools. We get some license revenue at that point. Because the way that we work is we license our technology, but we also have royalty revenue as well. So we're a risk sharing exercise. These customers like working with us because although we're parting them from some money, at the same time we're still involved in making it work. And so they like it when their product is successful and of course we like it when their product is successful because here we see the royalty revenue kick in. And so the royalty revenue when their product is successful becomes the dominant revenue earner for us. Now our licensees can choose, do they pay up front entirely? Or do they, you know, they might be a really good product opportunity, but they have very little money. So we can decide to say, well, forget the license revenue. What we'll have is a bigger royalty from you. So these are variables under our control. Some customers choose to pay up front, and then we know very little about it. But they're still required to report to us on the number of chips that are actually shipped. So with, even though we, the, we wouldn't have a royalty revenue from them at that point. So we have a total of 1,200 licensees licenses, I should say, sold uh, in, across all the world, uh, 163 new ones last year. 350 potential royalty play payers, which are, these are effectively 350 designs which are not yet at the royalty stage, and 20% uh, CAGR, 1.3, uh, that's interesting numbers, 1.3 billion revenue, of which we spend 28% on R&D. Huge percentage. This is not 2 or 3 percent on R&D because we don't have to carry a factory. But it does mean that we expect all of our employees to be highly qualified. So we have a, uh, an unusual for industry education profile. Uh, I think it's more than uh, 70, 80 percent of, pe of our employees have got a first degree and something like 30 percent have got a second degree or higher. So it's a very large percentage, very much more uh, aligned with what you'd recognize as a, an educational establishment or a university. 3,300 employees worldwide, roughly 1,000 in the UK. Um, the other thing that I didn't say is, look at the timescales here. These are long timescales. Despite the fact that we're talking about products only having a lifetime of a year, we're still talking about products, they have two, three, five, five to six years from a twinkle in somebody's eye until it's something which is on the shelves in B&Q um, or, or in PC World. Um, and some of these products go on for a very long time. We have CPUs which are being designed in professional applications which are still selling today and they were designed 20 years ago. And that's amazing considering the, the, the at least one of the market views tell you, tells you that products have only a one year lifetime. The other thing is it's a pipeline. You can start things down here and then you can spin off things which are going to deliver sequentially year after year. And of course that's what people do. They differentiate their products by all sorts of ways which are legitimate and that can include just repackaging what you've already done because repackaging is a genuine way of reuse and of differentiating your product from your competitors supplies. Now not surprisingly our vision is to dominate the world. Um, well then we're going to have vision. Of course we're doing surprisingly well at it already which is the good news and the bad news depending on which side of the fence you are. Uh, the good news is that we're, uh, we're, we are beneficent as a, as a company, so we are, we're not a huge company in the sense of our revenues. Our revenues, I think, what was the number, $1.3 billion, uh, yet we have a marketing cap capitalization of about $13, $14 billion. There are companies who are big companies uh, around you today who have a market cap which is lower than ours. 
so it's a, it's a particularly unusual business for that reason because the ratio between revenue and market capitalization is high um, nevertheless we are, see, we are key, we are central to that technology business so, so conclusions then, just to prove that I do actually get to the end sometime um, these are the most complex machines ever but they're driven by high volume commercial opportunities whose customers don't recognize or value the technical achievement um, and customers buy satisfaction of a need it's really unfortunate but it's the way it goes um, be interesting to see what happens after internet of things in fact because there is an argument that says that internet of things isn't bought by people anymore uh, so the consumer is the one who is buying the, the cameras and the organizers and, uh, uh, and things of that nature but as these, the internet of things become, becomes more embedded then the consumer becomes less aware of actually even buying that kit so when you buy a house it's got all the sensors embedded in the walls when you buy a piece of kit it's reporting on its usage you don't, you don't consciously turn it on it's just on, it's part of that piece of kit and so it will definitely change the way the market evolves Capabilities, and I think it's important to, to, to get this one home if nothing else, capabilities are the bridge between research and products because this is an important link. Because research is already struggling because it doesn't have a definable link to products because products are seen as the way that uh, businesses are sustained but it's also seen as the way that economies are sustained. So it's important to establish the way that research fits into product development. Uh, it's not simply a case of pushing science forward until it becomes a product. It's pushing science forward until it becomes a capability. Capabilities, the particular set required by a particular product uh, idea will vary from business to business so not all good science will find its way into all good businesses they're definitely matching pairs and we can't really finish without saying something about Moore's law because it's provided us with a huge technical opportunity for the last 50 years but we are actually getting pretty close to, at to atoms these days and as far as I'm aware nobody has, in has invented any smaller atoms and so we're, uh, we're certainly heading to an era where the consumer still expects change but we can't achieve it solely through Moore's law anymore and if you look at the products like the iPhone then you'll see that uh, packaging is becoming the major uh, way that, the, that this is achieved it's not just a single chip anymore it's putting them together and it's not about the delivery of a chip it's about the delivery of a system so we've moved from uh, component design into system design and real and virtual components are important parts of that so finally Designer productivity though is the driver for methodology and perfection will remain with the gods. So thank you very much for listening and I hope you found something of interest in all of that and uh, welcome to the future. <laughs>